Eight weeks after the tragic events of September the 11th, 2001, I travelled to New York City with my dad, who was running the New York Marathon. A young filmmaker, I followed my father around with my video camera. Britain had aligned itself with America, and a war on terror had been declared. We were already in Afghanistan. Yeah, but we're going to say Are you going to come and see Duran Duran, Dad? That was it? Yeah. For now. So we should stay down there for Wall Street. I'm not sure. That's fine. Maybe we should. Why? There's people there. Not being buried yet. It would be five years before I would become aware of whispers of a conspiracy behind 9-11 on the internet and a growing number of people calling themselves the 9-11 Truth Movement who believe that the US government itself had a hand in the attacks. Initially dismissive, but then intrigued by this viewpoint, I decided to make a documentary about the 9-11 truth movement. My journey started in Ipswich in England. I was contacted by a group of activists from East Anglia and invited to film them talking to the public about 9-11. What we've been told just isn't true. And the little pointers on there just agitate your thinking. Yeah. What do you think about all this then? Well, it's all, well, obviously we've read all about it, it but uh, going benefit, into detail everything. is a bit different, isn't it? You know, yeah. to really know what did happen. Yeah, I mean, they get you in an emotional state with what happened and then yeah. feed you yeah. what they want you to know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, anyone who questions anything different from the official yeah. story yeah. is a kook. Yeah. And, uh, but our points, and the points of scientists and physics professors, are very logical what they have yeah. to, what they have right. to say. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. it'd be worth looking at. We'll have a look at that. Thanks so much. Bye bye. 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 See what we can find out. I'll just leave you with a couple of leaflets for your staff members. It's regarding September the 11th, 2001, being their inside job. We're just trying to get a new investigation going for the whole thing. Okay, that's absolutely fine. Thank you very much. Yeah. Just for your uh, staff members to consider September the 11th, 2001, oh, yeah. was an inside job, not carried out by the zone bit long. Four planes in two hours flying about hijacked, clearly hijacked. Why weren't they intercepted? Standard operating procedure to intercept within minutes as soon as a plane is off, off course. A few more questions on there for you too. All right? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, an announcement, Osama bin Laden, that is, Osama bin Laden had nothing to do with September the 11th. Excuse me, turn your cameras off now. Nothing. Have you ever questioned the official story? No, I haven't. Four planes in two hours not intercepted? Uh, yeah. Have you ever questioned the official story of that, September the 11th? I do feel it's all very suspicious, but I really haven't, you know, been able to put my finger on it. The American government, I feel, are the biggest criminals in the world at the moment. Yeah, they, that's what people find hard to believe. Uh, well, people don't want to believe it because it means everything around them is fake. Yeah. And they look at their world and they look and they think, well, how can I be living in a world where somebody like that is doing what they're doing? And they don't want to believe it because it makes them uncomfortable. On that fateful day, um, you weren't meant to be in work. Um, what happened at the start of it all? Well, I called my supervisor, Anthony Santalamachia, to let him know that I was going to take the day off. And he went crazy. He said, no, no, you got to make it to work. you got to make it to work. You see, I was a per person in charge of cleaning 110 floors of stairwells from the top down of the building. And nobody, if I took off from work, nobody wanted to do my routine, my job. And they went crazy every time that I took the day off. So he said, no, make it to work. William Rodriguez is a former janitor who was in the North Tower of the World Trade Center on the day of 9-11. He has been honored by the White House for re-entering the building with the master key to open doors for firefighters, and as a result, saving many lives. The whole complex. The whole complex. What are your feelings towards the terrorists? 
I, we don't know exactly what was happening on that day. You see, uh, they gave us an official story that doesn't agree with uh, many of the things that we went through on 9-11. And they have used 9-11 as a tool to criminalize and prosecute Islam in general. They have done that. Uh, and we don't agree with this policy. We don't al agree with this agenda because we believe that politically our administration have taken advantage of 9-11 to further their uh, wishes and goals for war and for invasion and for a uh, power grab that we never agree with. At 846, we hear this boom, an, ex an explosion so loud and so powerful that puts us upward in the air, an indication that it came from below us. Then we heard the big boom on the top of the building, bah, and an explosion. Et à ce moment-là, on a entendu le grand boom en haut de l'immeuble, et puis une explosion. And it was the plane hitting the top. C'était donc l'avion qui avait frappé le haut. There were two different events, an initial explosion on the basement. Donc il y avait deux événements distincts, une explosion initiale dans le sous-sol, and then the impact of the plane on the top of the building. Et ensuite l'impact de l'avion en haut de l'immeuble. And again, everybody screaming, and nobody knew what to do at that moment. Uh, uh, a person comes running into the office saying, explosion, explosion, his hands extended, all the skin was pulled from under his armpits, all the way to the fingertips, and he was peeled off from his body. And when I looked at him, I realized that he was drenched in blood. And when I looked at his face, everybody started screaming in horror because they saw part of his left side of the face. And where did he come from? He came from the basement. An interview made to, about me last year by ABC News. Vous verrez une interview qu'a fait l'année dernière ABC News de moi. Where they tell my whole story about how, you know, the heroical effects, uh, effects on that day. But when I talk about the explosion, they cut automatically. They cut when I say, and there was an explosion. And they go and say, oh, what William Rodriguez heard was the plane hitting the tower. They put words in my mouth. On the morning of 9-11, he was in the basement. We hear, boom, an explosion so loud that puts us upwards on the air. And we started screaming. We didn't know what it was. It was the first hijacked plane that hit the tower. Boom! I knew that building with my eyes closed. So I could tell you very easily the difference of a sound coming from the top and a sound coming from the bottom. I met with the devil, like I said. I was trained because they saw me as the political tool to get uh, the Latino Hispanic vote, there's 30 million voters in the United States. And they say, this is the guy that can get the votes. Once they wind you and dine you, mm -hmm. basically you become part of the lie. Once I got the training, I started asking questions and I asked uh, for, for uh, official inquiry. And they said, no, don't do that. Don't ask that. Don't get involved with that. I noticed that they were putting obstacles. And then I realized that I was being manipulated, utilized as a photo opportunity for a political party just to get votes and in reality they didn't care anything of what the victims needed, anything that uh, had to do with the truth. Uh, Bush administration did not, did not want an official investigation about what happened on 9-11 and they actually put every obstacle possible so we will not have uh, an investigation. When you do an inquiry, you have to check every possible allegation and they did not. They spent more money on the Monica Lewinsky trial than they did at the loss of 3,000 people. And that's shameful. You know, I've been following you around for a couple of weeks and I've been working out what I think about the whole thing. And I think my ultimate conclusion is that if your story is correct, then the official story is not. Pretty much. So you're so telling me simple. my so you're telling me my story is not correct. No, no. I if my it. story, if my no, no, story no, no. is correct. I'm just saying if you put it in that context. Let's put it this way. This is very simple for people to digest and understand. I have an experience. I have unanswered questions that were not uh, investigated by the official uh, commission of 9/11, and even though they may have valid answers to it, they never did. They never put it in there. So we need to have all those unanswered questions, not only of my concerns, but the concerns of all the families, victims, survivors, and those affected of the event that were not addressed by this investigation. I went to the Notting Hill Carnival with a group of activists from London to see what the public reaction would be to these issues. Yes! 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 Yes!
Bush is an asswap, I don't care, yeah? He has got to do this, right? He needs to fucking go to hell, right? Make sure you put it on the news to everybody, right? This is a fucking ass. Brown is a fucking ass as well. You heard about the, heard about the argument? The 9/11 is, is what we've been told. There is a lot of conspiracy about that. There is a lot of conspiracy about it. But have you are you familiar with that, the argument? What I believe is some fighters in a cave. Yeah. Can't do a sophisticated job like that. What are the Americans want to go? They just say, oh, Al Qaeda's there. Yeah, yeah. They want to go in Afghanistan. Al Qaeda's in Afghanistan. They want to control the oil in Iraq. Oh, Al Qaeda in Iraq. They caught Saddam Hussein, the strongest man, the man with a lot of money and power. They could catch him within within months, but they could not catch uh, Bin Laden. I actually think the same, that whatever happened, the buildings cannot collapse in that speed and in that way, it's just like that. Impossible. They're always going to try and hush this. Things like this, they're always going to try and hush it. This is never going to be shown in the mainstream. Um, the media is like one of the most main um, ways that they manipulate people. And this isn't going to be shown in the main media. All you can do is try and reach people on the street. Conspiracy theories, just all facts. No theorising there. Not like, trying to blame anyone, just want a new investigation. That's what we're doing. Yeah. So we all know it was never a plane that went in, <laughs> Everyone knows. Why would they blow up their own people? From George Bush's point of view, it was the absolute ideal event in his career. Which makes you think, doesn't it? The next person I would meet on my journey would be Scott Forbes. OK, um, I, I worked in the World Trade Centre um, from 98 until 9-11 in 2001. Um, my interest in the whole issue of a conspiracy for 9-11 is uh, based on fact that there was a power down in the South Tower on the weekend of the 8th and 9th of September. Um, I worked on it, I was in the tower at the time so I know for a fact it occurred along with many colleagues. I was on, at home on the day of 9-11 um, witnessing the events from my apartment because of um, the requirement to work on the weekend prior to 9-11. I was sitting in my chair having coffee and um, I heard a noise which uh, sounded to me like um, a very heavy truck hitting a bump in the road and um, like bouncing. So the noise was like boom, 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 like that. So I got up and went to the window and looked between the Venetian blinds down to the road and there was nothing. So then I just looked up and in the North Tower, I saw smoke coming out from a high floor. At this point, I was hanging out of my bedroom window. I'd pulled the window up and the blinds and I was hanging out of the window on the phone and from the corner of my eye to my right, I saw the plane coming in, the second plane. It came in from over New Jersey, Staten Island way. And it came almost entirely across the Statue of Liberty, quite an angle, into the tower. But, and it was coming down as well. I saw the South Tower go down just before 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. I didn't believe it. I didn't believe my eyes. It, it looked like a fantasy film. Uh, what I saw was the building crumbling um, like sand. I remember thinking it looked like sand and instinctively I, it, the thought went through my head, well, what did we do at the weekend? I didn't believe my eyes and I didn't understand it either. And, you know, within 20, 25 seconds, where our offices had stood, there was just air and smoke. So we worked on the Saturday morning, shutting everything down, handed over to the Port Authority and it was handed back to us on the Sunday afternoon. So there was a period of probably 30 hours where there was no power. Right, and it wouldn't have just have affected camera security, it would have affected um, all the secure systems on doors. Um, for either key locks or security badges and so on to undo them. 
they weren't working because they're all powered by electricity, so there was no power, there was no backup system, therefore they were all open. Ah. Does it make you feel looking at those photos? Um, kind of nostalgic, really, because uh, it was fantastic working up there. I mean, you were working, but then you could just turn around and look out the window, and there was always something new going, going on every day. So, um, it was quite uh, an experience. In retrospect, of course, uh, looking back, um, uh, you think about everything that went on. Uh, the, the fact of the power down in itself was unusual. Um, the fact that there were visitors to the tower, many in overalls, um, like engineers of some kind, uh, wandering around the floors, uh, carrying toolboxes and cables and so on. At the time, didn't think, wasn't suspicious of it, didn't think anything of it. I guess my big thing is I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't like to be labelled like that. The information that I want acknowledged is factual, plain and simple. Um, so, you know, there's no... I don't have any clarion call for anybody. I just want the uh, truth to be um, acknowledged and explained. When I tried to register the information uh, with the 9-11 Commission, thereafter. And when I pursued it with the Port Authority to acknowledge it, and the information was not um, registered by the 9-11 Commission, and it was not acknowledged by the Port Authority and is now denied by the Port Authority that the power down took place. Islamic extremists were blamed for the events of September the 11th, 2001. I wanted to find out how this had affected the Muslim community and if Muslims thought we were being told the whole truth about 9 11. What do I think about 9 11? Okay, it was, um, when it happened, it was a tragedy and it was, it was unbelievable that it was in that, you know, we're living in this year and something like that could happen. It just looked like it was in a film. And it's awful for all the people that died, so it's a really bad tragedy. Whatever the reasoning was behind it or whoever did it. And the second part of the question for what about the Muslim, what it did towards the Muslim community, I think um, it's not necessarily what 9-11 did as the Muslim community, but it's the way that the media and the propaganda latched onto what they had, what evidence they had, and then they blew it up into a big Islamophobia that we now have a few years later. Well, to be honest, I still don't know who is responsible for 9-11, and I don't think any practicing Muslim would be involved in such an atrocity. Um, the Muslims are scared at the moment. They are being targeted unfairly, I believe. And truly, I think a lot of Muslims believe that this war is a war on Islam and not just on terror, as they call it. I don't blame the public. I blame the Muslims for not having educated the public long before something like that happened. Because if everybody knew what Islam is about and understood it properly, if that happened, no one would have said Islamic terrorists. No one would have said such words. They would have said crazy fanatics, madmen. Whoever it was, they were mad, obviously. Well, I think that the whole thing with the event, it has portrayed Muslims in a bad way. Because, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's just people's ignorance that go you know, yeah. into society and believes, oh, she's wearing the veil, oh, that person is like this, oh, they've got a beard, yeah. that means they're going to blow everyone up. The rest of us have had repercussions because of it, and like, we're not terrorists. Just because a few people might have some radical views, yeah, doesn't mean we all do. We're not all the same. Well, it's affected us a lot, you know, we're all getting blamed as terrorists and that. And uh, it's all... Conspiracy, really. <laughs> as far as I think. It's, it's all a big lie, wasn't it's it? Big you know lie. What I mean? It's like how the how it was set. You know what I mean? One little walk of plane going through like a building that size, a skyscraper, and it just. I mean, the way we remember we were watching it, and the way it come down, the it was like it a controlled demolition. 
that's how we see it, you know what I mean? Uh, call me a conspiracy theorist, however, the theories that I believe in have too many evidences against them, so they're not really theories. You know, if you look up the word conspiracy, it is a conspiracy. There's too many evidences for blatant lies, blatant trickery. Uh, I mean, come on, the most famous question of all is, where is the plane that landed in the Pentagon? I think there's more to it than just... Um that Muslims done it. The media influences the minds of the public a lot. So like, it's it's hard to like. We're only hearing the opinion of a few people. We don't hear the full story. There are two points of view. Some people say Muslims did it. Some people say, oh no, the American government did it. So I don't think personally I'm in a position to say who did it or who didn't. Well, the government is to an extent it's corrupted to the extent. But I don't believe 9/11 has been. That's what happened. I believe there's more to it. What are we doing today, Phil? Uh, we're about to go into a Tesco store and I'm going to make an announcement for the people to consider some facts about September the 11th, 2001 uh, being something other than what we've been told. Now, I purchased this shirt from eBay. Handy little find, a Tesco shirt. down of my uh, announcement. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, as I was in Laden, was nothing to do with September the 11th, 2001. That was an inside joke. Go to info That's info Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. According to the Comptroller General of the United States, there are serious financial pro management problems at the Pentagon, to which Mr. Cooper alluded. Fiscal year 1999, 2.3 trillion missing. Fiscal year 2000, 1.1 trillion missing. And DOD is the number one reason why the government can't balance its checkbook. The Pentagon has claimed year after year that the reason it can't account for the money is because its computers don't communicate with each other. My second question, Mr. Secretary, is who has the contracts today to make those systems communicate with each other? How long have they had those contracts? And how much have the taxpayers paid for them? Finally, Mr. Secretary, after the last hearing, I thought that my office was promised a written response to my question regarding the four war games on September 11th. I have not yet received that re response, but would like for you to respond to the questions that I've put to you today, and then I do expect the written response to my previous question, hopefully by the end of the week. I mean, what, what do you want to get out of this trip here? Oh, this trip is about 911 truth. Yeah. And it's interesting, it's like, I can't believe I'm in Britain uh, for September 11th. When, um, I think it was 1791, uh, George Washington warned in his farewell address, he warned the American people to beware the false patriots who will wrap themselves in the flag but betray your values. I think we've definitely got um, that personified in this yeah. administration. But the 911 truthers now are able to see through all of that and um, their sole motivation is just find out what happened that day. How did U.S. a multi-trillion dollar military and intelligence infrastructure fail four times on one day? That's all. Just tell us how that happened. 
So if you could proceed to my second question, please. The, um, the second Go question, uh, I've forgotten what the second question was. Could you repeat the question to make sure I'm answering the right question? This is 9-11 question. The question was, we had four war games going on on September 11th, and the question that I tried to pose before the uh, secretary had to go to lunch was um, whether or not the activities of the four war games going on on September 11th actually impaired our ability to, to respond to the attacks. Uh, the answer to the question is no, did not impair our response. In fact, uh, General Eberhardt, who was in the commander of North American Aerospace Defense Command, as he testified in front of the 9-11 Commission, I believe, I believe he told them that it enhanced our ability to respond, given that NORAD didn't have the overall responsibility for responding to the attacks today. That was uh, an FAA responsibility. But they were, uh, they were two CPXs. There was one Department of Justice exercise that didn't have anything to do with the, the other three. And there was an actual operation ongoing because there was some Russian bomber activity up near Alaska. So we Let had, me ask you this then, who was in charge of managing those war games? And, uh, this, this and General, uh, why don't you give the, uh, uh, give the best answer you can here in a short period of time and we'll... Yep. Uh, the general lady wants to get a written answer anyway, and then we can move on uh, to other folks. The important thing to realize is North American Aerospace Defense Command was responsible. Uh, these are uh, command post exercises. What that means is all the battle positions that uh, are normally not filled are indeed filled. So it was an easy transition from an exercise into a real world situation. It actually enhanced the, the response. Otherwise, it would take somewhere between 30 minutes and a couple of hours to fill those positions, those battle spaces with the the, the right staff officers. Mr. Chairman, begging your indulgence, was September 11th declared a national security special event day? I have to look back, I do not know. You mean after the fact or before the No, because of the activities going on that had been scheduled at the United Nations that day. I'd have to go back and check, I don't know. Thank you. Okay, I thank the gentlelady. The, um, Citizenship is demanding accountability from those who are charged with the responsibility of representation of the people and who have power over the public purse. Cynthia McKinney is a former U.S. Congresswoman for the state of Georgia. She served as a Democrat in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1993 to 2003 and from 2005 to 2007. It was just over a week before the anniversary of 9-11 and I spent a few days with her in London. This is not what I normally have done, but that's similar, so something like that. I have never done on a camera, but you know, this is gonna end up on the editor's floor. So I, I, have, I have complete confidence. Corporate decisions or personal decisions that lead the, to the slanting of stories, um, a sizable number of people have caught on to that now. And they understand that when President Eisenhower warned the American people against the unfettered aims of a military industrial complex, that that military industrial complex now is comprised of military, industrial, financial, media complex. And all of them work together in a way to promote their interests and oftentimes promoting their interests comes at the expense of the people's interests. That's the problem. This hour we're talking about Iraq, the war on terror, terrorism, Basra, the British pull out of Basra Palace. Is it a retreat and a defeat? Was there a successful job well done for the Brits, working as best they can in difficult circumstances? First of all, I, I need to say that I reject your paradigm 
of uh, retreat and defeat or job well done. I think that is about sensationalism in the media rather than actually dealing with the substance of so what's, what's the substance? happening. The substance is that I think we need to remember how we actually ended up in this situation. Mm -hmm. How was that? It was because of September 11th. How did an infrastructure that has cost U.S. taxpayers trillions of dollars mm. fail four times in one day? And um, members of Congress should be asking that question. It's a, a question of accountability. Members of Congress received talking points. And the talking points said that we were hit because we are free, that we are hated because we're free. And that was really the explanation that was given to us, and we were supposed to take that message back to our constituents and tell them that we're hit it, we were hit because we're free. Well, I mean, as a responsible representative of the people, that wasn't a sufficient explanation for me. And if you want to call and join in the discussion with uh, Congresswoman uh, McKinney, feel free to call me, 0871722344. Join in the discussion. Do you agree with her? Do you disagree with that? What do you think about the American involvement? What do you think about how it all started? I don't want to go down the conspiracy theory route again. It's been done to death. What we're talking about tonight is what we're going to do now. And here's what I want well, to go... I, I, you wait, said, I haven't finished. You wait said for again, it. and wait, I reject wait, again, because no wait, one has gone down the conspiracy wait. theory Well, route. I tell you what, but I'm you... not going to talk about conspiracy theories because it's Good. my programme, so there, how about that? Good. Well, I'm not talking so about conspiracy So, we're not going to do you conspiracy are. theories. That word is used by people who don't think. It's easy to um, not think about real questions or the answers to real questions if you can just lump everything together in, you know, something that's silly and then say, oh, that's silly, and then you can dis disregard the issue. But war and peace, life and death, those are not issues that can be disregarded. You know, we had a lot of callers on this evening sounding anti-American, and I hate to... You actually sound... And your, your, your views might be construed as being anti-American, anti-Guantanamo Bay, anti-the war, uh, dissenting outside the American embassy. Oh, you, you're, you must be a proud American. It's, it, it's amazing that you... Uh, paint such a um, bombastic paradigm. Laura, I can am you look pro up peace. bombastic? I, I look it am, up in the dictionary. I am pro peace. Now, well, I'm pro in, peace. In, I was in, in the military for 16 you, years. If you think that being pro peace is anti American, what does that say about your ideas about what being pro American is? I'm the one who asked the question as a member of Congress from Georgia. What did the administration know and when did it know it about the tragic events of September 11th? As a result of asking that question, I've paid the ultimate political price in having aroused the ire of all establishment circles. Um, have the distinction of having been kicked out of office two times. My first campaign for Congress was run in 1992, and my campaign theme was warriors don't wear medals, they wear scars. I've got lots of scars. I guess it comes with the territory. It's all right. I returned to New York City five days before the anniversary of 9-11. Upon returning to Ground Zero six years after I was first there, it all felt very real, and looking down at the pit, it struck me that this place is still an open wound. I was in New York to film activities around the six-year anniversary of 9-11. I met up with a group called We Are Change, started by Luke Radowski, who are known for their street actions and confrontations of allegedly corrupt politicians. Uh, it's, 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 it's the kickoff of the five-day start off uh, of uh, events that we're going to have here in New York City, the fundraiser for the first responders, and hopefully it's going to be a good, great weekend and we're going to make some noise. You know, 
Um, I actually towed the party line for a good two years. Uh, I was very personally affected by 9-11. Um, you know, I was one of those people who really cared. I went down to donate blood after it happened. You know, I wanted to jump down there on the pile and rescue people. Um, and I've always been open-minded. And the thing is, I just never came into the information. For a good two years, I had never been exposed to the information for whatever reason. And, you know, as soon as it was put in front of me, I was like, hmm, that's really interesting. And I, you know, got to doing my own research, got to, uh, you know, doing some reading, doing some, uh, you know, watching some documentaries. And the more you dig into 9-11, the worse it gets, the worse it stinks. Too many anomalies, too many inconsistencies. The 9-11 Commission report is a total fraud. Anyone with an open mind can see that. And uh, we just deserve some answers. As citizens of this country, as New Yorkers, as a native New Yorker, I deserve answers for what went down on 9-11. Uncle Tom was somebody that uh, used to be at work early every morning, and he was caught in the towers. Um, his body was found two months later. We had to go through all the, the um, sorrow again, you know, in remembering you know, his, his life. At the very least, the 9-11 commission was a grand cover-up. Um, at the very most, um, criminal elements within the United States government, specific agencies, uh, made 9-11 happen. And the rest of the world needs to know that, because when the rest of the world does, then the American people are going to sit back and they're going to say, you know what, for the past six years I've been sleeping. The, for the past six years the American people have been entertained and told to go out and buy things. But this is the reality. Turn off the TVs, get, do, do your own research, find out about the physics, find out about the history, Take it to that level where you get it, where you're confident enough to speak about this with family and friends. You know, they they will call you, uh, you know, conspiracy nuts. But in, but then you know what? Until they learn and they realize what what really happened six years ago, um, we're going to get our country back. You're in a willful state of denial. The laws of physics were not suspended for one day. NORAD doesn't just stand down for one day. What do you know more about celebrity? Then you know about the physics of 9-11. And why are you okay with that? World Trade Center 7 collapsed without being in by plane. 9-11 was inside the you know, What is it, six years now? And it's just too much. It's too much to take. You know, on 9-11, I knew. I was like, yo, the CIA, NORAD, they know what's going on. I didn't know anything about any of the inside job stuff then, but I knew that much then. That NORAD had to have seen those planes change direction. So. After that, I just investigated more and more, and here I am. I'm, you know, I live in New York City. I can't, I can't not come out here. You know what I mean? I was down there. Yeah, yeah, I was. I was down there. So what are you doing about it? You saw people die. They're dying now. They're dying now. You're a disgrace because you don't know anything. You're a disgrace. You're a disgrace. Go out, go home and watch a reality TV. Go back to sleep. You're a hero, aren't you? Stop. 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 So what is that? So you think Ben Laden can make Norad stand down? We're showing up in front of the different broadcasting studios, so we can let everybody know. Uh, you know, throughout the city, that the mainstream media has to begin to do their job. So we're here uh, at the CBS, one of the studios, uh, for their uh, morning show, and basically what we want to do is inform everybody around here uh, that 9-11 uh, was an inside job, that the mainstream media has to start doing its job, and that citizen journalists like us are really changing the way America gets their news. We do not want an investigation that was set up by the same government that we are what we basically have evidence against. We want a new investigation. We want justice for not only the family members, but the first responders who went in there to find the bodies of my uncle and 3,000 others that are dying today from the lies that were given five days after 9-11, the lies of 9-11. These first responders, some of 
have already died, uh, they have lung, their lung capacity is, is half of what it used to be. Why isn't the mainstream media reporting on their stories? Why isn't the mainstream media reporting about 70% 70, 70 of family members' questions were never answered during the 9-11 commission report? Why is America okay with that? You guys are idiots! No! Have you no, have you actually done? Job. Yes, I have. No, you guys are a disgrace. No, you guys are a disgrace because you are spitting. You are spitting on the memory of every person who died. You are spitting on the memory. What the hell? I'm a family member. My uncle died on 9-11. What do you mean I'm spitting on his memory? Because I resent that. You? I really resent that. And if you're not willing, you if you're not, not willing to read anything, if you're not willing I've to open read your all mind, the crazy how can you call us theories? Why can't you comprehend that planes crashed into buildings because terrorists took it over? Why can't you That's comprehend fine, that? What we can understand. Why can't you comprehend no, that? Yeah, but if the you, laws if of you, physics still the building, hold. the laws of the physics, building was yes. designed to withstand uh, not a jetliner going 600 miles an hour. It was not withheld. Look, because. What gain? What makes you think the government, the government, could keep you secret well, like you this? And it's an inside you know job. Say, and I believe there's conspiracies out there, but well, again, the how is it possible? The only conspiracy how? theory is the one the government told you. How is it that's possible? That's the only one. We're not even asking people involved, right? Somebody had to set up well, the. That's what investigation. Somebody set up all the demolition bombs and yeah, igniters exactly, and all that. Exactly. How come those people aren't coming forward? The actual. We're trying to bring them. We're trying to find out. We're trying to find out. Just like the guy on the Gracie Knoll. Where's the trigger man? Show me the guy, and then I'll. Stop listening. Oh. Well, what would be the point of them doing that? Well, think about it. it the Patriot Act, they can take away our rights as Americans with the Patriot Act. They can, you know, wipe their ass with the Constitution. And invade Iraq. They can invade Iraq, invade Afghanistan. They make lots of money, man. War is money. It means arms deals. It means weapons, you know, arms deals, oil deals. All types of manufacturing deals. It's a lot of money. War is big business. Well, I mean, there are a number of different theories, but I have a, you know, a lot of doubts about the way it was presented. Sure. I'm interested in hearing all of this information by people who I think who have seen the, you know, have done their research. But uh, but I like to have you know a critical opinion. Clearly, it's it's the the correlation between the, the World Trade Center and the war in Iraq is, is completely faulty, and uh, and we've been manipulated. And the fact that the government has used that as a carte blanche to invade uh, you know Iraq for no reason, you know that that to me leads into a lot of questions that I don't understand. So it is Islam, the basic principle. It had been a long and exhausting day, and as we returned to our hotel in Brooklyn, we ran into two Muslims preaching on the subway. I'm here making a documentary about the 9-11 uh, truth movement. The 9-11 what? Truth movement. You mean like what really happened? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so basically, I was wondering what your thoughts are about that. <laughs> We've heard a lot of things, um, but I myself, with the level of belief that I have, I can't accuse people of things without proofs, but the way how it's been broken down by the experts as far as how these towers came down, it doesn't seem possible for us to, to really, really believe with comfort that the two planes was able to take down three buildings. It just really doesn't, it doesn't sit right, you know, it's not something that you say if, if you have sense, if you look into the issue, not that you just watch TV and you hear and you believe whatever you hear, but if you look into the issue and you use the, the approach that the specialists have used, then you have a problem with it. But who are you going to take this problem to? You know what I mean? Really. You can't just... Some things are out of your hands. <laughs> and I think this is one of those things. The following morning, we made our way down to Ground Zero. If you push weight down on top of something, right? You got all that fire going on on below. You got tons of building and steel on top. Yeah, but the problem with the problem with that is there's only one problem with that, though. The problem with that is it's never take, happened you know before. After not take a small piece of steel, all right, and keep a torch on it for a while, and just push your weight on it, all right, and keep your torch on it. And eventually, that steel is going to give underneath you. I don't know. Guys, guys, guys. Listen, you got a mind. You're in. You're. You're in. You're in, a, you're, in a, you're in a mindset, and you're going to stay in the mindset. I'm not going to change your mindset. Okay? You weren't here. You were probably in high school watching it. 
I was here. I'll all right. Tell you so about my friend. Hold on one don't second. My me. friend John Schroeder, FDNY Company 10, Ladder 10. He was right there. Right. Yes. Yeah. And I knew the lieutenant that day. All right. Okay. All right. I'm not, I'm not saying. I'm not trying to say anything right. against the you. Lieutenant I is respect a of mine. you. I respect you. One thing we're doing. We're trying to also aware people about the air quality issue. If you were here that day, I bet you're probably your lung and your health is not as good as right. it was before. That's why we're down here. That's one here thing today. we're doing here. Yeah. yeah. And that's why we're also down here too. We're doing a big fundraiser for first responders. And one of our biggest first responder members is John Schroeder, the fire prayer who's in that building. One thing I would have to tell you. He was actually inside the towers, and he saw a lot of stuff. And he saw dead people on the 20th floor, on the 10th floor. And he, when he came in there, he saw the lobby blow up, right? And this, his testimony was ignored by the Nalem Commission Report, NIST, FEMA, all the engineers and all the scientists. His story collaborates with William Rodriguez. I don't know if you know the gentleman. He's a rescue, he's, a, he's a, one of the heroes of Nalem because he was the janitor who opened the door and saved John Schroeder's life. And him and, and saw the same things, explosions going off in the buildings that were ignored. And these are key critical questions that were ignored and were not answered. Okay, when did you first start to question the official story? About four and a half years ago. I didn't want to believe it. I mean, when I first got into this, I never wanted to believe it. Never. And it took me a good, I researched the crap out of this. And it took me a lot of sleepless nights just to understand the real story about it. I really don't want to believe it, but... It's something that we all need to face and understand, and it's not an easy thing to understand, but I think we have to just to save this country. Because the truth about 9-11 is that we don't know the truth about 9-11. The Pentagon and NORAD have lied. Now this is serious business, because this crime was solved within hours of the tower collapse. We were given 19 hijackers' photographs on the television and told who did it. And now the FBI has admitted that Osama bin Laden is no longer wanted for the crimes of 9-11. If you go to FBI.gov today, you will read Osama bin Laden's wanted poster. It says nothing about 9-11. Why don't you know this? Because you have not looked into the facts about 9-11. Because a lot of you are thinking, this is conspiracy nonsense. My God, if this was true, the mainstream media would be all over this. Let's talk about the mainstream media. Here's a picture of Jay Staley from BBC on the day of 9-11, reporting the collapse of that building, Building 7, 20 minutes before its collapse. How did she know? 9-11 cover up! 9-11 cover up! That evening, the protest moved down to Times Square. I lost my Uncle Mickey on Flight 93 almost six years ago, coming up this Tuesday. We're seeking justice for him. We're seeking justice for the rest of the family members, for the first responders, and for people all over the world who have lost their lives. So your uncle was on Flight 93? Based on this lie, yeah. Well, that's the story. Flight 93 is a pretty weird one. You know? Did he make a phone call? Not that I know of. Honestly, I think all you guys watch some stupid video on Gmail and you believe what you see. Why don't you just take it for the fucking what you saw that day? What do you, what do you have, a card here? Why has it never been explained why so much steel turned into molten metal at the WT site? Yo, I've seen that video what? about the Pentagon, how there was no planes or anything yeah, there. I, saw that. I still don't believe it. The trade they picked up the fucking planes and then they left. And that's what the pictures after, after the fact. No, they said that because George Bush doesn't like black people. Are you guys? Are you that's guys? Bush are you guys that did? Are you guys people. the guys that did loose change? No. George Bush hates black people. <laughs> I'll agree with that. Wasn't the World Trade Center building one that was made with like a column? It was a column building, so that when the buildings hit it, the fire incinerated the entire middle, and that's what, what that's what took it down. And that's why it collapsed on the inside, like a demolition. At this point, Alex Jones arrives. Alex Jones is a syndicated radio host from Austin, Texas, who has a huge following in the 9/11 movement. that are listening to this for the first time and are wondering what we're talking about, it's important to understand. Throughout history, criminal elements of governments have staged terror attacks or staged horrible events to launch wars or oppress their people. 
They create crises to offer the solution. The 9-11 attacks were carried out by the military industrial complex. To, to blame it on the Constitution Bill of Rights, to blame it on imaginary foreign enemies, and to sell us on World War III and one world government. 9-11 was carried out by the military industrial complex to sell the world on a new age of tyranny. And we're here to tell them a new renaissance is beginning of liberty and freedom, not of tyranny. And that's why they carried out the attacks, because they are scared to death they are afraid of you, the people, and the fact that the alternative media is growing and that their power monopoly is failing. So again, I salute you for being here to expose the 9-11 inside job. 9-11 was an inside job. 9-11 was an inside job. because you want to shut down free speech, you came up and punched me in the back, you little punk. 9-11 was an inside job. 9-11 was an inside job. The group gets word that there is an outside live Fox News broadcast going on a few blocks away. to protest or demonstrate here in New York, but this anarchist group came forward. They really are the, one of the least attractive groups of demonstrators I've ever seen. And this is the moment I got arrested live on Fox News for filming someone else getting arrested. If violence breaks out, don't worry, we can handle it. Our, uh, our Fox News team can take this bunch of... Uh, <laughs> I don't want to use any foul language, but... Uh, uh, the funny thing, let me go back to our scripted program. This is operating sound device without a permit. Ah, this is free America? Well, I know this. They could try some technical thing with the Class C that they gave me that is like speeding or jaywalking. But the other camera guys did nothing. Yes, these guys... I mean, I was filming him. I was just in the zone, man. I was just looking in the screen. And the next minute, bam. What was your charge was for? What did everybody do something uh, for? Traffic, violent. Uh, traffic. Stopping traffic. Stopping yeah. traffic. They were out in the street. Listen, I really don't want to get arrested Stop. again, man. So yeah, I listen, wanna, folks. Get out of here. Thank you for coming. <laughs> thank you for the support. Yeah. It had been an incredibly surreal night. But the following morning, we were back out in Union Square. I'm Richard Gage. I'm an architect. I've been an architect for 20 years. I'm the founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. We now have 160 architects, for, architects and engineers signed on demanding a new investigation of Congress, an unimpeachable investigation with subpoena power. By next year, I promise you, we're going to have 1,000 architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. I heard David Ray Griffin talking about the 118 first responders who were recorded by the city's New York Fire Commissioner. What did they talk about? Every one of those 118 talked about explosions, flashes of light, 
sounds of explosions before the body above the airplane impacts in those buildings came down. That's extraordinary. Did any of that information find its way into the FEMA report, into the NIST report? No. Do we see it on the media today? It's been hidden and very effectively hidden, but the truth cannot be hidden for long. It's coming out and we are growing by millions every year. You can't not see it and go, oh my God, this is true. These buildings, one, two, and seven came down by controlled demolition. It's clear we've got thermite, uh, chemical evidence of thermite and incendiary used by the military. We've got ex a pulverization of concrete and the World Trade Center towers to the size of talcum powder. There's a mechanism that has to create that. That mechanism can only be explosives. The gravitational collapse, the gravitational energy of this, of this collapse does, cannot produce talcum powder. It cannot produce molten metal. Let's face it, fires are only 14, 1500 degrees, typical office fires. That's true with jet fuel too. Fires cannot make molten metal. There's a thousand degrees of difference. Steel doesn't even begin to melt until uh, 3000 degrees. We're talking three, 4000 degree temperatures found by the firemen flowing like lava. Where did that come from? Hey. Good afternoon. We're here at Union Square. We're ready to chant. We're going to be waking the rest of the people up that haven't come out. People are going to hear in the building surrounding us. People are going to hear in the subway station below. 9-11 was inside job. We're here for a fundraiser for first responders. It's going to be starting at Webster Hall in about an hour and a half. And, uh, you know, this is, this is it. Day three. 9-11 was an inside job. 9-11 was an inside job. And this is why it's so difficult for 9-11 survivors to get out of the I mean, I've done it, I don't know how many times I've talked about this, but you're watching, my son died. And it was a gruesome death, extremely gruesome death. And I'm a lucky one. I took my son home. And he suffered horribly. I don't, I'm not really positive. That's been part of my investigation, along with finding the truth. But what happened to him? What happened in the last split second? Well, Pierre goes through that. Did your child suffer? How much did they suffer? Did they die immediately? I have a family member whose son was six foot five, about 245 pounds, and he disintegrated. How did, how, did he, how did he disintegrate? But they don't want to ask the questions. It's just such a horrible, horrible, horrible thing to think of. I went to all the commission hearing meetings. I actually had hope that some truth would come out of those. I was very enthusiastic. I used to take drive down and take the trains down, but it didn't last long. I'm in the FBI building. Mother's standing here talking with family members. They asked them, how did you know that these hijackers were taking train over training to fly down in the airports in Florida? One day afterwards, not even a day. The next day, they're not even talking 24 hours. He said, well, maybe we got lucky. That's his answer. We asked him about the put options. How come so many people make money off these, uh, these explosions from 9-11, uh, from the 9-11 attacks? They saw that's disinformation. So here we are, FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They investigated one day. They gave us a 19 hijackers and said, that's it. Stories ended. They're there for one reason. It's Alan Dulles said when he first formed the CIA. He says this is not about communism. This is about the unfettered access of the corporate world over natural resources. And it's not going to change. And I don't know how we're going to have to change, but the only way we can do it, and this is the one opportunity we have, because we were talking earlier, this is their Achilles heel. They fucked up.
Salvatore B. Calabro, Joseph M. Calandrillo, Philip V. Calcagno. I hope everybody uh, is able to hear his name. I hope everybody's listening to all the names being read. Every one of us should understand that each one that was lost that day, they have a family that's grieving right now. Uh, each one that was lost that day have colleagues that are grieving for them. Um, we have, we've done a lot in the past four days, and this is the fifth day, and uh, this is the day um, where six years later we hear the names read again, and uh, it comes back, it comes back real, real heavy. Stephen Kalayo, Christopher M. Calasanti, Kevin Nathaniel Colbert, Michelle P. Colbert. It's come tomorrow, they'll all be gone. This guy lost family members, I lost friends. They come down here for one day a year to take pictures, and then they all disappear. It's horrible. Look, look at all the suits taking pictures. And my friend, Captain Joe Farley, and members of They have no idea what really, what, what, what it's all about. What's going on in your ear behind you, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Not this pitches bullshit. Excuse my French, I'm sorry. Just makes me sick. Firefighter Joseph Angelini Sr., Rescue Company 1, and his son, Firefighter Joseph Angelini Jr. That's what it's all about. See that? That's what it's all about. Right there. And his hat was in that hole. Not this. Jonathan M. Connors. Kevin Do you hear that thing, sir? Huh? Do you hear that Kevin F. Yeah. Conroy. I was here for 11 days after that. Dennis. Keep spending millions of dollars and billions of dollars overseas, and the Wallens still ain't rebuilt, and, and, and they won't even give goddamn health care to, to the guys who were down here and who were sick and dying. We're waiting for it. Please. Wait, can I get your name? Jack Ambrosi. Six years ago, 8,000 pounds of steel crushed my left foot here. I spent 11 weeks in the hospital. Uh, fought for my life. I turned around my pain and suffering and I started a foundation that helps 9-11 responders who were sick and dying. I'm here today on the six year anniversary to remember those who were lost that day. But I'm also here today to re-energize myself. Help me stay focused and know why I'm fighting for what I'm fighting for. It's a somber day, it's a sad day, but it makes me angry that we're here. So many sick 9-11 responders are dying because of the lack of compassion by our government. And uh, today's a ceasefire for me. Pay respect to those lost, but tomorrow I'll be fighting for those who are sick. I got out of the hospital after 9 11. I was on crutches for months. Yeah. So, so I'm laying in bed and someone knocks on the door. So I, I, I you know, I, I'm hobbling. It took me about five minutes to get to the door. So I'm like this and there's no one there. So I go to open the door and there's a basket on the stoop and he was laying in the basket and there's a little card that says, I hope this makes you feel better. So he's only six? Yeah, but he has Lyme disease, so he got bit by a tick. So when 9-11 happened, I was upstate in Nanuet doing a demolition job and uh, we heard the first tower was hit. Nobody really knew the extent of what was going on. You know, there were so many conflicting reports. A small plane hit the tower, then it was a big plane. Then, you know, when the second plane hit, we obviously, everybody, you know. So uh, I shut the drop site down and uh, gave everybody the option of staying there, which is about a half an hour out of the city. We are going home to their families because, you know, we thought we were under attack. When I got there on the 12th, uh, it was so intimidating. Never seen anything like it in my life. I can block it out now. I have that, I don't know, gift of blocking things out and not looking back, but I can smell it still. And every time I shut my eyes, I can still remember the smell of Ground Zero. 
um, from the moment I got there, I said, this place is unsafe. Someone's going to get hurt. And I prided myself on doing the jobs I did that no one ever got hurt under my supervision. So for five days before I actually got hurt, I kept saying, somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to get hurt. I guess I willed it upon myself that it was me. Funny thing is, four hours before I got hurt, I was driving a Bobcat just to clean the street up so we can get the trucks in closer to the pile to load them. That Bobcat pushed a plate that was covering a hole that was an 80-foot drop into the subway. The Bobcat was teetering in the hole, and I'm looking down while I'm in the Bobcat. I'm like, I'm going to die. You know, and then somebody was smart enough in a larger <clears throat> machine, a payloader, and picked me up in the Bobcat in his, in his bucket. That guy saved my life. And then four hours later, I was horribly injured when uh, about 8,000 pounds, that's, that's what they say, uh, um, crushed my left foot. Um, the guy next to me fainted. I took his belt and I made a tourniquet below my knee. Blood was shooting out about six feet high in the air. Um, took my boot off. There were bones sticking out of the sock, so I couldn't get the sock off, so I had to cut it with a razor blade. Within three or four minutes, the fire department was there. They were like, you're going to be okay. They, you're going to be okay. And, and then they turned around and went, you know, like. This was made by my niece when she was six years old. She's uh, 12 now, but pretty good for a six-year-old. Hence why she's first in the class. And I spent about nine weeks with gangrene, fighting for my life, and then fighting not to have anything amputated. And then the time came where they said, John, you'll probably eventually lose part of your foot. I said, you guys sure of that? And they're like, yeah. I said, well, then cut it off. I was my decision, you know, let's get out of this hospital. You know, life goes on. What I like to do, every time I get one in, the government has to give 9-11 responders a billion dollars. We were rushed to clean up so they can get the almighty dollar back on financial Wall Street and in New York. Um, Think they were negligent? 100% negligent, and they lied. Um, you know, OSHA said they had signs up saying wear a mask and a respirator. I was there for five and a half days. Nobody ever said, hey, John, put on a mask. This might save your life. Uh, I saw so many people without a mask, and then I saw some people with really good masks, and I saw some people with no mask, and then I saw people with the little paper mask, which did nothing. You might as well put two tissues in your nose. Really did nothing. Um, they lied. It's, a, it's the bottom line, they lied, and whoever says they didn't lie has the IQ of a soap dish. <clears throat> Christy Todd Whitman on September 16th said the air was safe to breathe, the water was safe to drink, and she's denying she said that now, but it's on everybody's film and tape, and history will show that that woman lied, and she took orders from the White House, and it's proof in the pudding that human life took a backseat to the almighty dollar. My name's David Miller. I was... Uh, E-5, I was a sergeant with the 1st and 69th Infantry, New York Army National Guard, Company C, 42nd Division. And on the morning of 9-11, I was one of, the thou one of thousands of other first responders who went down to the pile uh, in rescue attempts of the victims of 9-11, which we've now become as well. And on the morning of 9-11, I was going to work. And my wife called me on my cell phone. I'd gotten married. My wife called me. We were together for six years now. And she said that an airplane hit the World Trade Center. I said, yeah, okay, that sounds terrible. What do you want me to do? And she said, no, you don't understand, it's a big airplane. I said, no shit, really? Like a real big airplane? She said, yeah, it's on fire. I was thinking, damn. How can an airplane hit the World Trade Center? And about, I don't know, maybe 10, 20 minutes later, she called me and said, another airplane hit the World Trade Center. I said, stay in the house. And I went running home, and I got my uniform on. And I pulled out a pair of clippers, and I buzzed my hair. And I kissed her, and I said, stay in the house. And I went running down, literally running. I think this was the last time that I really ran about two and a half miles to the Kingsbridge Armory. And other guys were there already. And my first sergeant said, mount up, we're going in. 30 minutes later, we started going on to the pile. Between this time, the second building had come down. And 
we had gotten a good portion of that plume. And we marched onto the pile. And uh, there's no way to really describe what it looked like. Um, there weren't any whole corpses that I saw. Everything was really, really, really badly destroyed. There wasn't any furniture in peace. There were fires everywhere. There were cars burning. It was horrible and horrendous. And if you want to really understand what the pile looked like, I'm not the one to talk to because it's not something I want to go into. It was a war zone. Any war zone you want to think of magnified times 10, and that was ground zero. It was really beyond belief. Things I will talk about, the fires, there were fires everywhere. And we started helping the fire department, grabbing hoses, moving rubble, um, picking up body parts. And that's what we did for the next 10 days. Give me a kiss. I got a new 9-11 responder, so don't be yelling. Who is it? Do I know him? Alan Forcier is a former NYPD undercover narcotics detective. As much as you feel comfortable with, you just tell me kind of what it was like down at Ground Zero. Yeah, it wasn't fun, <laughs> you know. I really don't like talking about it. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't nice. You know, it was morbid. That's all you could say. You know, cloud, the smoke, everything. You know, it's just. No one had masks, no one had nothing, you know, it was just chaos, total chaos. It would look like, a, you know, it looks like war. That's all you could say. It okay. wasn't nice. Well, I was down there that evening, later on that night, for a few hours. And I was called back. And I was down there, like, two out of the next three days for a few hours. There was an undercover, so I pulled those out of there. Then I was down there because of the media, the cameras and the uh, media exposure. And then within the next week or so, they put us in the Staten Island landfill. We went through that stuff at the landfill by hand. Not, not by just walking around. We went through it by hand. We moved stuff by hand. That stuff was on our glove. We wore gloves, yes, but we had masks after a while, yes. We had 12-hour shifts. You don't leave those masks on for 12 hours. You gotta eat. You're sweating, you gotta take that thing off, catch some air, because you can't breathe right with those things on you. It's, you gotta go like this, the stuff gets on you. As you can hear me wheezing. <sighs> um, I'm on a lot of medication. I have, you know, approximately 20 something pills a day, three inhalers. Um, constantly tired. I sleep a lot. Very winded. So the more and more I talk, the more and more winded I'm getting. It's not good. It's actually, it's horrible. <laughs> it just never ends. It's getting worse and worse as the days go on. The breathing, the tiredness. My heart's pumping at a, 30, a percentage of 36%. It's just the uh, blood flow. And that affects the breathing also, besides the condition of the lungs. My lung capacity is at 59% right now. My guys started coming in. A few of them couldn't stop throwing up. It's a sign of poisoning. New York State Department of Health didn't send in a toxicologist. We asked three times. I asked my first sergeant three times and I know he went up the chain of command. He has three times. Has New York State EPA given a clear sign? Should we mop up? Now, we had mop gear with us. Mission oriented protective posture. No one leaves the armory without an M17A2 protective mask. It's a full respirator. You can walk into sarin gas with that fucking thing on. And just the smoke alone coming off the pile from all those fires. It sounds like I'm talking in a circle, but I'm not. Remember all those fires I was telling you about? A lot of those were from cars. Do you know what gasoline fires do to your body? Breathing in burning gasoline does to your body. It fucks you up badly. It makes your alveoli burst. Airborne. Huh?
The next first responder I met was Kevin McPadden, an ex-US Army Air Force Reserve medic. Dogs were moaning because of breathing in the, the, the dust. The dogs were in pain. The search dogs. I believe it was this one right here. I slept on this bench. I shoveled it all out. And I slept. This bench was covered with dust up to here. And I shoveled it all out and I covered it with wool blankets and I slept there. And I remember just watching that clock across, across the river. Dave is a very brave man. He doesn't credit himself nearly enough. You know, he's a, he was a sergeant, a buck sergeant down there. He was in charge of a good amount of men. When I got absorbed, I was part of uh, his unit's medical support. There was downtime and we were getting some rest. And Dave came running into the base, the base camp over in Manhattan College. And he's like, we got a mission, we got a mission. He's screaming on top of his lungs. And uh, everybody hopped to, you know, got up and we got in formation. And uh, Dave was right up in there in the front of formation. And uh, they let us out. The, uh, the officers let us out. They marched us up to the buildings that we had to evacuate. And uh, it was like, you know, we, we were getting involved in this and that and this and that. And, and then we turn around and the heads are spinning and there's no officers, there's no leaders. We're like, huh? So we were like, well, what do we do? You know, like, well, we got to do something. And I was like overwhelmed and mind boggled by it. And it was like, Dave just was like, bing, bang, boom, freaking came out. He was like, he knew all the plans, what to do. He's like, everybody, one, two, one, two, all the ones over here, all the twos over there, separate into here, two, two, two nurses per team, one doctor per team. And he, he just fell right into play like, like a watch. By 2004, I'm obviously sick. I can't get out of bed many days. I can't breathe. I'm vomiting. I got, and by 2004, people are starting to talk about there's something wrong with the first responders. 2004, I go to my doctor. I've got some lung obstructions. I've got some, well, maybe I got some real damage from 9-11. Let me figure out what I can do here. And I start investigating it, and by 2005, I'm diagnosed with asbestosis. It took me almost a year to get diagnosed. I got diagnosed with asbestosis. 2006, I get diagnosed with mesothelioma, lung cancer. I need all my medications and Do you feel let down by the government? Of course. You know, government, city, state, give all the different medications I take. What do you think they should have done for you? Uh, the city especially, with the police department, three-quarter pension. I got denied social security disability. You know, just give me what I deserve. That's all I want, you know? They say my sicknesses aren't job-related, which means the sicknesses I got weren't from job-related causes, like, you know, my lungs were sick because they said I smoked. My heart's not related to the 9-11 things, you know, from related because of 9-11. They said it's, since they call it idiopathic cardiomyopathy, they say idiopathic means unknown origin. I take all these pills a day. Each one of those bottles a day? Yeah, and these inhalers. That's a day. <laughs> it's a lot of medication. It's a, as John says, it's a poo poo platter. It's a lot of shit. So, I call him Skittles. I call him Skittles because he's got a plethora. It looks like candy. 3,000 people, give or take, died that day on 9 11. 2,700 civilians, 343 firefighters and all those police officers. The 9-11 responders, the construction workers, the cops, the firemen, we're gonna outnumber them, outnumber them in 10, 15 years, 20 years. They're already up, they say a couple hundred have died since 
give that a few more years when the cancers and the respiratory problems finally take their toll on these guys in the post-traumatic, we will outnumber them. So they're building a memorial on a wall for all of those who perished on 9-11. I hope they leave a big space, empty space, to keep adding names for everybody that died since 9-11 because they need to be honored too. And I did this speech and I told people what had happened to us and I told people that we were also killed on 9-11 and we were still in those buildings and to do something to avenge us. And it felt just really lousy and unfair that we put everything on the line to go in to that hellish pile and so many others put so much on the line and lost everything. And nobody remembered while we were getting sick that they needed to do something for us. There are first responders all across the country who are contaminated and they're not getting any support and any care and we know their stories and we know their names and their addresses and their phone numbers and no one's doing anything for them. John Feel and the Feel Good Foundation can only do so much. Is your, um, is your illness definitely terminal? If they come up with a cure for mesothelioma in the next 12 months, no. But there's one other aspect is besides mesothelioma. That's the concrete. How long can you live with concrete in your lungs? You know, Dave's just trying to lead, live his life with what he's got left of it. And I'm sitting there, you know, like, are you all right? I call him all the time, are you all right? You know, do you need anything? And it just make. I think he, he might feel like I'm not, you know, he's not as bad. He's like, look, I got a lot, of, I got life left in me. I could do this, you know, and I, I'm not useless yet. And he gets frustrated with me because all I want to do is help him constantly because I faced the devil with him. We saw the demon right in front of us, and, and, and we, didn't, we didn't back off. And there's very few men in my life I'd ever find, I think, that would be of his caliber. So I don't want to lose him. I'm going to be really, really, really upset when, if I lose him. She's really all I got from this, this horrific day. Is there, Everything else is like smoke and mirrors, it's not real. Dave's really the only thing real to me. And if he's gone, I don't fucking know. I'm going to be really upset. He's a, he was a great man. He's a great man. The cancer will kill me before the concrete, but the concrete, let's talk about the concrete. How'd that concrete get pulverized? Pulverized. Billions of tons of it. I mean, the buildings just didn't fall. They went into dust. <laughs> Fine particles of dust. Have you ever tried to find out what the particle weight of that dust was? It's the consistency of baby powder. We breathed all that in. For days. For days and days and days and days. So it's no wonder we're sick. See, we know the buildings collapsed. But let's look at why the concrete was pulverized. Yeah, okay, the, let's say the, bill, the, the fires did melt and the core popped, which is fantastic. But now the concrete would fall, right? But it wouldn't turn into dust. So there had to be another force there. The Red Cross rep was like, he goes over and he, and he, and he says, well, you gotta stay behind this line because they're thinking about bringing the building down. They didn't say what building, they just said bringing a building down. So we're like, okay, you know, we'll, we'll take their word before it, you know, we'll stay behind the line. And he went over and he talked to one of the, uh, through all the commotion, he goes over and he asked one of the Red Cross, or one of the firefighters, what was going on. I guess, I don't know if he got an answer or not. He came back over with his hand over the radio and it sounded like a countdown. And at the last few seconds, he took his hand off and you heard three, two, one, and he was just saying, just run for your life, just run for your life. And then it was like another two, three seconds, you heard explosions, like ba boom. It's like a distinct sound. It's not like when in compression, like boom, 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 like floors that were dropping and collapsing. This was 
a boom, and like you felt a rumble in the ground, like almost like you wanted to grab onto something. That, to me, I knew that was an explosion. There was no doubt in my mind. And by that time, we're running out into the street. Half the people had taken off, running up the street, and then everybody's running it into the center of the street. Meanwhile, everybody that was south of that intersection was running up the street, getting chased by this cloud of smoke, which was monstrous. And that was Building 7 falling? That was Building 7 that fell, yes. I worked at Site 7, the, the controversial Site 7. Occasionally I went over to the, where the towers fell um, and, and assisted or just directed orders. Because I, I was there to delegate orders. I wasn't there to even get dirty. Um, at Site 7, it was just uh, a building came down. Um, I'm not an expert on what happened with the towers, and I don't waste my energy on all of the conspiracy things with the towers, but they came down. But if I was going to Las Vegas and I was a gambling man, I would lay money on something's wrong with Site 7 and why it came down. Um, Fire doesn't destroy a steel building. At the time it came down, if the government said we imploded it, I wouldn't be surprised. I just don't have proof, and I don't spend my energy on that. But if it smells like an implosion and it looks like an implosion, then it's an implosion. And how do you feel about um, people indicating that there's a conspiracy behind 9-11? We all got our opinions. I just get a little pissed off when I talk about it, so I don't really want to talk about it. But there's definitely something behind it. What can you do, right? There's something behind it. Without a doubt. But there's nothing I can prove, so no one's going to listen to me, so there's nothing much you could say about it. That should be enough, I think. Huh? Yeah. Thanks very much, Al. No problem. Not much you can say about the conspiracy, so. But you don't, I mean, it doesn't make, because a lot of times, you know, people that talk about the kind of conspiracy stuff, um, people say you're disrespecting the victims, you're disrespecting people that are affected by it. So you don't feel like it's disrespectful to look into it. Mm. Not much you could say. Government, there's something behind it, but you don't know for sure, so you can't really say that. It'll come out sooner or later, probably when we're all dead. It'll come out. Probably 100, down, 100 years down the road. Who knows? You know, it's just another one of these conspiracy theories that get, gets uh, hind hidden under the carpet of history. I just hope I'm, I'm around and alive still for when it's unveiled, but I don't think I'm going to be. I'm lucky if I got, like they said, 12 to 15 years, approximately, before my lungs start failing. I'm going to make the best of it until then. And people don't care. They look out the window, they see the sun shining, say, hey, it's not affecting my life, and they just press on. They just go on aloof. Like they don't, you know. That's all they care about is what's going on in their immediate, in their immediate world. They're not conscious of, conscious of what's really going on. Their neighbors, their, their, the, the world for that matter. I just hope there's hope for humankind, but hope is a disease.